Welcome back to Between the Levees. I'm joined today by Calvin Addison Jr. Prior to today, he was not much more than a Facebook connection that I found because he was liking and commenting, I believe, on Travis Balance's post or yeah. something back in the day. Uh huh. This okay. guy has been in the industry about 13 years, been a, a licensed tankerman for 10. And I've got some more questions for him. So, Calvin, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. First things first, I told you. I saw on Facebook this morning, man. What's with this this Uno game? Oh, <laughs> uh, that, that that from that was from a couple years back. I was at a I was at a friend's house. Uh, me and him actually worked together uh, on the boats when I first started out, and uh, we uh, you know we just stayed you know we just stayed friends after even after I left the company. <laughs> um, but he uh, he invited me over like he always does, and it was a game. They were just having a game night, and walk in and he's handing me a shot immediately i'm just like really are we doing it like this he's like yep so take a shot walk in we're playing uno every hand that you lose you had to take a shot so i think i was like maybe eight shots in at that point and i got tired of losing <laughs> i kind of lost my cool at one point <laughs> i think i had the whole stack in my hand before we finished the game because like when you lost you had to take the whole stack with you and there was like there was no more i think he had me do a draw four or, or draw two or something like that. Then it got reversed to me again. I had a draw by the time, like I said, by the time I finished, I had the whole stack in my hand. I was just like, you know what? I'm tired of losing. Let's play something else. Y'all are really vexing me right now. So no drunken Uno. Okay, no. Roger. <laughs> yeah, no, no time soon, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be one again sometime soon. Well, tell me real quick, uh, just kind of about your, your family life today. Oh, family life's good, man. Uh, um. My dad, uh, uh, it's me, my mom, uh, have, uh, uh, man, let's see if I can, let's see if I can get this. It's, it's a lot of us in here. I have one biological sister. I have, uh, it's just really, it's just me and my sister. And I have three adopted sisters and two adopted brothers. Uh, my mom is a retired, uh, daycare worker. And my dad is a, uh, retired firefighter. Currently my sister works as a, uh, recruiting specialist or a company in Texas. Uh, everybody's so scattered right now. It's, it's really hard to keep up with everybody. Uh, my, uh, but uh, my other adopted siblings, they, they still live in Louisiana. Uh, they still live here in Baton Rouge. Well, as these all have begun, sir, tell me, where were you born? Uh, I was born here in Baton Rouge. Um, don't really plan on moving at all. Pretty much a homebody. I stay close. I like staying close to family. Um, uh, graduated from uh, Baker High School in 98, so showing my age here, 43 years old now. What was life growing up in, in the 80s? <laughs> uh, it was, it was like this, I, I, I missed the 80s. It was chill. Um, uh, I didn't really get into a whole lot as a kid, man. I, I was pretty, I was a pretty good kid. Uh, I didn't get around into, like, doing anything bad, things like that, because I mean, I had my whole family, like, watching me, basically. Any, any neighborhood that we grew up in, we moved to, I had my family like right there. Any school that I went to, I had family members working there. So I've always had eyes watching me. Like I say, not that I was doing anything bad, but I was, I was, I was, I was taken care of as, as a kid too, like that. But life was good. My parents made sure that uh, we had everything we had, and uh, I mean everything that we needed. And um, you know, I, I have no complaints about my childhood, man. It was, it was pretty good growing up. I, I'm not gonna lie. It was the only, the only rough part of my childhood is I always kind of considered myself as a I guess you can say an outsider. I liked a lot of things that other kids didn't. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, as far as like uh, my taste in music, uh, TV show, TV uh, TV shows that I watched, things like that. It was, I guess it was, can't say it was considered like <laughs> normal, I guess you could say. So I was different and I got picked on a lot. But I mean, I still had, I still had friends uh, who always had my back and everything. So it was, it was still a good childhood though. What kind of music did you listen to that was so abnormal? Uh, but for me, I think it was I think it wasn't normal a lot a lot of rock and roll. Like uh, one of my favorite rock bands was Kiss. Growing up, uh, I, I, owed, I actually owed that to a friend of mine. He introduced me to the band and uh, uh, listened to Motley Crue, things like that. Phil Collins. Uh, I never really listened to a whole lot of rap music growing up. I got you. Look at you. All right, man. <laughs> um, were you? Did you attend college? Yeah. Uh, for. For, for a moment, uh, after I graduated, I attended Sun University for for about a semester. Um, I didn't 
I, I, I kind of just went to go. I like not really knowing what I wanted to do. <clears throat> it was, it was kind of a, it was kind of a, I don't know. Like I said, I felt like I had to do it. So I only went there like for for a semester. Um, after that, I, I flunked out. Um, so I just started working. Uh, at the time, I had a little little job at a grocery store in, uh, not far from my house. And uh, I was at the time I was kind of I was okay. I, I was good at computer. Well, I wasn't good, but um, I was into computers a lot at that time. So uh, I enrolled into Remington College. It was a little tech school uh, here in Baton Rouge. <clears throat> uh, I went there for um, and what did I go for? Uh, computer networking. Uh, I attended that for two two and a half years. Uh, graduated, got my associate's degree. And I uh, wound up getting a job kind of closely related to the field uh, with the state of Louisiana. But uh, after Katrina, I wound up losing that job. Um, it was, uh, I worked at the uh, uh, Louisiana Department of Labor. I uh, worked in the uh, in the computer room there. Well, how was Katrina for you? It wasn't bad. Um, as far as where we stayed, uh, we didn't get a whole lot of damage uh, compared to, of course, what happened to it uh, happened in New Orleans, but we didn't get a whole lot of damage, um, but it was more of a strain, I guess, on the state uh, itself. And uh, like I said, I wound up uh, uh, getting laid off my, uh, from my state job at that time. But uh, the, the, as far as like the impact that Katrina had on, I guess you could say our our normal life, I guess you could say, um, it, it, things weren't, weren't too bad, like I said, considering what happened in, uh, in New Orleans. And did you find your way to the maritime industry after that? No, after that, I I joined a uh, what do you call it a uh, temp service. I joined up with a temp service, and I had about four or five jobs through them because you know with a temp service you get on a job and they only have you for so long, and uh, until you move on to something else. So I might have had three or four jobs before then. And at the time, my sister worked for was a recruiting specialist for a, a security uh, for a, a security office firm. Um, so she got me a job with that. I was a mall cop for four years. <laughs> and uh <laughs> at the time I did have a I think within my second year of having that job, a friend of mine who was in the maritime industry was trying to get me out there. And I kind of shied away from it because I, I just didn't at the time, I guess I was kind of in a I felt myself I was I was, was kind of in a, a a stump. I just didn't want to try to pursue anything else. I was just trying to just make do with what I had. And after my fourth year, uh, you know, I went back to him. I said, look, man. I think I'm gonna try. I'm, I think I want to try that, that 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 fleet job you were telling me about. So he showed me where to go sign up, fill out the application, and they responded back pretty quick. I want to say the second day, uh, I got an email saying that uh, I've been uh, selected to come in for an interview and uh, all that good stuff. So uh, and that was 2009. Kind of felt like I got in kind of late. So. Uh, uh, so I wound up uh, leaving the uh, leaving them all. Started with uh, started with uh, ACL and I mean uh, and uh, the port out of fleet. And the interview process was pretty good, but the uh, the the physical part of it was what really like what really was the was the hard part. They had us of course, and it was in the middle of the July, and just the I wasn't used to working out into the in the elements like that. So it was that was definitely a, a change of pace. But uh, I got through it, and uh, I started uh, in August of, uh, like I said, August of 2009, and uh, I made it there uh, three years in that fleet. Was the heat the hardest part? I would say the heat was the second hardest part. Um, learning how to lay my wires and learning the difference, you know, your upriver and your down lip release and things like that, that, that was probably the hardest. The heat came second. What was the training program for you? The training program, um, from what I can remember, uh, they didn't take us out immediately. Uh, it was more indoor work first. I mean, not indoor work. Uh, it was more, uh, you know, of course, going over policy and procedure and things like that. And once we did go out, uh, get out there, it was, it wasn't, it was new to me. So of course, it, it felt hard. But like I said, after a while, um, I, I, I still didn't get. It. I still, I still couldn't grasp the concept even after coming out of the training program. Um, so my lead man at the time. Uh, I can't remember his name, but uh, he took the time out to really like show me uh, how to properly lay my wires, uh, how to identify, you know, how to uh, 
you know, tie bowling night and things like that. So um, not saying I didn't earn anything in the training program, but it was just, it was, it was a lot harder for me to grasp. Like I said, it was, it was something new and, you know, it's as hard as I, I tried to apply myself uh, to, 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 uh, to learn everything. It was just, I just wasn't grasping. So I just, so um, Damien, Damien, that was, that was his name. So he, he, he really took the time out to show me, you know, how, how to, really uh you know do my job efficiently any highlights or interesting stories come to mind about your three years on deck those three years in the fleet it was i had a let's go like this i had a, i had a good crew so we were always it was always jokes it was always it was, it was always something happening there um we all we were always playing jokes on each other and things like that uh one thing actually came to mind we uh it was a uh, one day we we're all in the we we're all in the coupling and i think it was uh i think a. Uh, I think it was a snake that uh that had ran by somebody's foot or whatever. And one of the guys, he, he wasn't he wasn't scared of, of, of snakes at all. As a matter of fact, this time I was working at all my uh on my fleet. And he just literally like just picked it up and just started running around everybody with it. It was I don't know, it was, it was a crazy time at that time, man. Um that was just one of the stories that kind of stick out in my mind. Uh another one was <laughs> uh I wasn't watching where I was going one day and uh, I stepped into a I stepped into an open hash cover. It was in the middle of, it was, it was like in the middle of the night. And my lead man turned around and saw me like sticking, had my one foot out of the manhole cover and one foot in. So I'm just kind of like dangling there. It's like, man, you gonna help me? You just don't look at me. I mean, I wasn't hurt, but it was more of an embarrassing situation more than anything. I'm glad you didn't get hurt. I've been down in those things. I I don't want to fall in that. No, no, I, I've never been, I've never been down in one myself. That's the closest I've ever come down, actually going down into a into a boy tank. It ain't fun down there, but uh, I've got uh, a buddy in Australia is going to really enjoy that snake story. Mm. I'm sure he'll be, he'll be listening to this as soon as I publish it. But anyway, <laughs> uh, so how does your career advance next? I know, I think you, you went for your tankerman's license, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I knew that. Uh, it, the, tell me about that process. What does it take to get your tankerman's license? Well, first you have to be, I guess it all depends on how well the, the route that I went. But well, traditionally, the route goes. I mean, once you once you learn everything on deck, uh, uh, I guess you submit a request to be put into the tanking program. And if you're selected, uh, you get sent off to tanking school. Uh, you have to take a. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what it is now, but at the time that I went, uh, it was a four day firefighters class, and I believe a four or five day uh, uh, tankerman's class. The the actual tankerman's class. Uh, the firefighters class is actually the, the fun part of it. You get to don the, the whole get up, you get to don the whole suit. Uh, and I think on your, it was on our last day, uh, you get put into a, uh, I know every school is different, but this particular school, they put us inside of a, uh, uh, put us inside of a ship container and they had a stack of pallets set on fire. So we had to go in there to team three uh, and everybody would get a chance to, Work the holes, learning how to properly put out, uh, how to properly extinguish out a fire. Uh, the, I'm sorry, I skipped one. The second to last day, you get to simulate a smoke rescue. Since we couldn't properly simulate that, they just put us in a classroom, an empty classroom, shut all the lights off, and we had to feel our way around searching for the the body. But uh, the the last two, the, the previous two days is because. Uh, uh, it's all uh, all textbook work. Uh, as far as the tankerman training, uh, it's mostly all textbook work. Uh, the school that I went to, it was, some of the textbooks seemed a little old, so they were going at that time. They were kind of going to more. Um, it's, it was more like old school thing, or old school stuff. So I mean, it, it, it still pertained to a lot of the uh, a lot of the knowledge that we still needed. Uh, as far as uh, getting through the class. Well, for the sake of those Australian viewers and for anybody outside the industry that might be watching this, tell me, uh, define what a tankerman is. Uh, well, a tankerman is basically a, uh, I don't want to use that, that term that everybody says, glorified deckhand, but it's more than that. Um, basically, a, a man, a, a person who is a PIC, a person in charge, who uh, maintains the, uh, the flow and the uh, transfer and the discharge of uh, dangerous liquids inside of uh, to and from facilities from a barge. Well, tell me, uh, you kind of started to tell me the transition from deck to tankerman. So let's get back to that. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, once you uh, once you pass all your tests, um, you get a certificate saying that you're you're certified to uh, 
to, to begin training for uh, for your tankerman's license. You don't get a lot of people think you get your license on like the internet. You don't. You still have to uh, go back to your place of employment, and you still have to get your five loads and five discharges. Um, and do um, uh, depending on like, depending on where you work. I know every company is different. Uh, I believe one company actually you need to get 50, 25 and 25, 25 loads and 25 discharges. So a total of 50 to become Exxon, or Exxon certified. How many tank rings do you do per year? Or I guess really per hitch, if that's easier. All depends on, it depends on what run you have. Uh, if you're cross channeling, man, you can like say in, in Baton Rouge, you have Exxon and then right across from there, you have a uh, plastic Port Allen. If you're stuck on one of those, on the, one of those runs, you can do, Mm, maybe up to and depending on the schedule you work i should say if you work a 28 and 14 schedule you, you'll probably do about 15 transfers in one in one 28 day hitch uh, if you're on a run say from houston to all the way up to Wherington, west virginia you might do one transfer a week or you might not do any depending on when you go on the actual dock so it, it, it all depends on your uh, it all depends on your location Kind of walk me through a, a tankering operation. Um, like from from uh, from the time we dock to the actual time that you start. Sure. Okay. Um, well, uh, as soon as your as soon as your barge is docked, uh, you'll uh, nine times out of ten you'll either be waiting on an inspector to board your vessel, or sometimes the like I said, depending on the dock's discretion, that uh, they may they may want to hook up the hose right away, but. Typically, you have to wait until an inspector comes on your barge to make sure the barge is ready to be transferred, ready to be operated. So um, after that happens, uh, you may hook up a hose. If you're by yourself, if you're doing a barge on, uh, if you're hooking up tandem, that's two barges, and you'll have a short tank and come on and assist you on hooking up the hoses, uh, hooking up your crossover hose. Nine times out of 10, uh, the dock may not be, they may not be ready for you for a couple of hours, but once they are, uh, you'll sign what's called a DOI, uh, Declaration of Inspection. And that's basically saying that you agree to, to your knowledge that the barge is ready to be, has been inspected and everything is ready to be, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the transfer is ready to commence. So once the DOI is signed, uh, sometimes a, a line displacement, sometimes a line displacement is, is going to be required. And, uh, that's basically going to be clearing the line of any old product that could be that could still any traces of an old product that was still that could still be in that line. <clears throat> and once that's done, uh, an inspector will come out, gauge your tanks, make sure and uh, take a take a bar sample to make sure that the, the product that's been uh, that's been put into the barge is is a uh, will pass inspection. Basically, there's no trace. There's no basically it's not contaminated. So uh, once that passes inspection, um, Depending on how you're loading, like I said, depending on how you're loading, if you're loading one barge, uh, and depending on what kind of what type of product that you're loading, you want to start at a slow rate to prevent any static buildup. So typically you want to start at uh like so again, depending what type of barge um type of transfer you, you know, you're doing, uh, you want to start at a slow rate of about 600 barrels, I'm sorry, about 600 barrels an hour. <laughs> Real slow rate, the basic like gravitational rate. Uh, once you get to about a foot of product in your tanks, then you can start at a, a full rate. Basically, they'll turn the pump on. And uh, you'll never want to start at about 5,000 barrels an hour. You never don't want to go and think about 5,000 5, barrels an hour. <laughs> How long does it take to discharge a barge? In a normal, um, in a usual uh, transfer, a normal transfer, I should say, between six, maybe eight hours. That's on a single barge. A double barge might take in between in, anywhere between ten to twelve hours. And do these barges carry? Uh, how many compartments do they have? Uh, depends. Some have three, some have six, some have eight. I've even heard, but I've never worked on one before. I've heard that there's a there's twelve uh, compartment barge out there out there somewhere. I, I I have I haven't run into it. I don't want to run into it. I don't want no part of it. <laughs> but typically, it's a it's a six tank barge. And is it always the same cargo? Typically, no, no. But I have been, uh, I have been on bars where it has been two different, two different types, uh, two different cargoes, and at one time it's called a split load. And I assume there's line displacement necessary, or is it from the same family? Um, 
no, usually typically a line displacement. From 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 my knowledge, uh, I, I believe it's it's been a while since I've actually done one, but I think a line displacement is is done between uh, between both of those transfers. Well, how many companies have you worked for? Uh, four. Well, Calvin, do you have any uh, any kind of message for anybody out there in the industry? Uh. No, I mean, not so much in the industry, man, but I mean, it's, uh, to be honest with you, I, I, I didn't think I'd be out here as long as I've been. Uh, I, and it's been a, like I said, it's been 13 years and I didn't think I'd be out here this long. Um, it's, uh, it's had its ups and its downs and uh, uh, more ups, actually more downs. I mean, ever since I, because of, because of the industry, man, I was able to purchase my first home, purchase the car I wanted. Um, it's been, you know, I've run into, I've, I've worked with a lot of good people out here. I, I work with some a-holes out here. I mean, but you're going to find that at every job. Um, so, I mean, I, I guess one thing I say to, to everybody out there in the industry, man, y'all just, we just, just stay safe, man. And let's try to minimize a lot of, uh, a lot of the uh, incidents that, uh, that can happen and that could happen. Cause I've, I've been in, I've been in quite a, I don't want to say quite a few of them, but I, the incidents I have been in is uh, a few of them could have been avoided. A lot of them are just mechanical areas. I mean, so things happen. Um, anybody that's, that hasn't even thought about getting a job out here, uh, I would say give it a shot. I mean, I did, and I'm thankful for it. Uh, I'm learning new stuff every day, even even though even though I've been out here this long. So, but I, I, I had a captain. I'm up to the first captain I worked with. He, he did tell me, you'll never stop learning anything out here. Uh, even he's 60-something years old, been out here since he was 15. And he's still learns new stuff every day. So he said, "This just you'll never stop learning new things." And that's and that he, this, that's true. To, that's true to his word. He, that every day, I'm not learning new things, especially out on those barges. So you said you had another story from the fleet, huh? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so my second year there, uh, my port captain. All right, I think. Uh, yeah, Facebook. Yes, yeah, Facebook was still around. Was around there. So. I had put some old pictures up on my Facebook and my poor captain at the time, he, I guess he had a Facebook or whatever. He had this, he had this habit of playing jokes on everybody in the fleet. So he came across my Facebook and I had posted some, he went through some of my pictures and I had some pictures of me uh, in my mall cop uniform. Less than flattering because our uniforms, we had the, we had the white security shirts with the badge. And then we had the lovely, very respectable Constable hats. He found that picture, <laughs> printed it out, proceeded to go to the guard station and put that picture all around the guard station. We crew change. We everybody come. We come to the doctor crew change, and the first thing everybody sees is pictures of me in my mall cop uniform, plastered all around the guard station. And the port captain is in the parking lot laughing his ass off. I was like. Bro, really? This is what we're doing now. Nobody knew. Never, nobody knew I was a ball cop before until that day. So yeah, that was a, that was it was embarrassing. It was embarrassing, but it was funny as shit. I mean, he 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 was always doing stuff like that, man. I was like, bro, are you serious right now? <laughs> what kind of shit did you catch for it from the guys? Uh, you know, of course, you you already know the name, Paul Blart. <laughs> I got the name Paul Blart for the rest of my days. <laughs> huh. That was like I said. Like I said, we had we had fun in the fleet, man. We always we all we're always playing jokes and stuff on each other. Roger. Well, what would you have to tell newcomers or people looking at the industry? Just give it a shot. Don't. It's not. If you don't think that, because uh, the the thing that deters people away from here is being away from home. And if you don't think you can be away from home, then, then, then don't come out here. I mean, because it's it it is what it is out here. I, I I I thought I had to think about it for a while before I even decided to even go on a live on boat. And I had to look at the positives more than the cons. I mean, yeah, I'm not gonna be home for a lot of things. I'm not gonna be available a lot, but I had to look at the positives too, especially uh, especially of the uh, the uh, the the financial aspect of it. I mean, like I say, it provides it provides me a good life, um, and it'll pay off in the end. Don't look at the now. Look at look ahead and see what see what the industry can could provide for you. Well, I think that'll do it, man. But I appreciate your time today. All right, thanks for having me, man. Yep, absolutely. We'll keep in touch. Sure thing. This has been a production of Where You At Studios LLC.